Have you ever had a specific space and shape in mind for a structure on your layout, but you couldn't find the perfect kit to fit the bill? Or maybe you were trying to model a specific prototype structure, but no kit quite came close. Imagine having a vision for your layout and being able to bring it to life by modifying a kit and transforming it into a jaw-dropping masterpiece that no one else has on their layout. That's the power of kit bashing. Today, in part two of this video series on building a complex structure for crown cork and seal, we'll explore how I identified a kit as a starting point, combined it with pieces from my scrap box and created a totally unique masterpiece to fit my space. And the best part, you do not have to be an expert modeler to do it. So buckle up and stay tuned for an exciting trip into the world of kit bashing. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the knowledge, tools, and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. In the first part of this series, I talked about the project overall and how I built the curtain wall for the crown cork and seal building for the Eastern Avenue corner on my layout. If you recall, and if you don't, maybe, maybe go check out part one. I broke the construction for the structure itself into three parts. One was the large curtain wall. Two was the kit bash portion, which included different elevations. And three was the tower, which we'll cover in the next episode. Later installments of the series will also cover the overpasses and scenery. In this video, we'll cover the construction of the kit bash section. Now I should mention that this building is different than previous kit bashes I've covered on the channel because previously I've modified the buildings but left large expanses of the kit's pieces intact, mainly modifying the layout and position of the walls. In this case, none of the wall pieces I used from the kit stayed in their original form, as we'll see. So on to part two. This is where we started, and this is where we ended up. But in between was this, and this. One of the reasons that this project took so long was figuring out how to kit bash this section. Here's the part on the prototype building that I'm trying to replicate. Note that there's a center panel, and then there are two panels that essentially match each other on each side of that main piece. After looking around, I didn't find any kit out there that was a good match for this prototype structure right out of the box. But I did remember once kit bashing a Walther's REA building, and I remembered how it had a narrowish, tall end wall, which could be a good stand-in for the center section of this crown wall, and it also had long side walls with square windows that might be a good fit if I could cut them down, then layer those side walls over the end wall. I thought it could work, but that still didn't solve the problem of what to do to get the structure down below track level for this entryway. While the REA building would work for the upper stories, it wasn't going to be anywhere close to a match for this section down here. So I spent a long time searching around for a kit that could cover both bases, top and bottom. After spending a lot of time on it and striking out, I gave up and decided I'd go with the REA kit on top and piece something together for the bottom story. As an aside, the internet is a great thing for finding information about individual kits in a hurry. But when it comes to kit bashing and finding kits that have the look I'm after, I still prefer to leaf through the Walther's catalog. Someone asked me once about the collection of Walther's catalogs on my shelf over here, and honestly, that's part of the reason I keep them. Now, I'm no Luddite, but having a large selection of listings with pictures to leaf through is way easier than trying to find suitable kits using Google searches. And that's why I still pick up a printed catalog every couple of years, even if they don't list as much as they used to. So this is the area where this kit bash section will go. On the prototype, this building extends back a long way, but I have about six inches to play with, which also needed to provide access to some hidden trackage. Then there are the elevation considerations. Here we have a two inch elevation difference and over here it's a three inch difference. While I love the idea of the elevation change, it's also been vexing me for quite some time because I wanted to be able to have the curtain wall section on flat ground. But as the building comes over to this section here, drop down into that depressed area. This three inch deep area over here is actually a street, so we won't worry about that for this structure build, but it'll come into play later. This is what I had to work with, and it provided some interesting challenges that we'll cover as we go along. I started the construction process by trimming the REA building walls from the sprues using my Micromark sprue cutters. I'll include links to all the Micromark products I use in the video in the description below. And you can use coupon code PIXELDEPOT to get 10% off your entire order every day at Micromark. At this point in the process, I still wasn't sure which parts of the walls would end up in the final structure. I decided to make a mock-up from foam core I got at the dollar store so that I could measure everything out and see what worked. 
With the foam core, I could cut the pieces up and reassemble them in different sizes and shapes without having to cut the kit walls themselves. That way, if I made a mistake, I'd only need to go get some more $1 foam core, not another $40 kit. I started the process by tracing the walls onto the foam core. I included both the wall edges as well as any openings that are in the walls so that I'd be able to get a rough idea of how the walls look, including the windows and doors when I cut them up and repasted them together later. Then I cut the stand-ins out using a straight edge to ensure accuracy because you want the size of the foam core to be as close to the actual kit piece as possible to get a good measurement. Based on the shape of the prototype building and the vision I had in my head, I knew I'd be only using one of the end pieces. For the center wall section itself, I decided to use the end of the building with four sets of equal size windows and to make the bottom cut even with the tops of the lower course of window and door openings. I decided to use half of each of the kit's side walls, cutting them down so that there'd be a pilaster in between each wall and the center wall section. Finally, I decided to cut the side wall pilasters where the tops of the loading doors would be on the stock kit. To make sure this would fit in the area I had, I taped the pieces together and put them in place. This piece over here shows the basic form that I wanted, and you can see from this view that on the side section I had originally thought about using a wall piece that included windows, but eventually I decided to go with a blank wall there because I was going to have to cut an opening in it anyway. Based on this mock-up, I was happy with the look and shape of the section and now knew that it would fit in the area that I had. It still didn't solve the problem of how I would build the section that extends below track level, but one problem at a time. With that decided, it was time to go back to the bench. Using my emery board, I made sure that there was no flash or sprue remnants left on any of the pieces that I was going to use, and I then marked where I'd be cutting those pieces with a super fine marker just so that I wouldn't screw things up. Refer back to not wanting to buy another $40 kit. Using the backside of an X-Acto blade, I started to score the pieces. Full disclosure, I made the mistake of not using a straight edge. Seriously, I know better. So of course, to reward me, the blade slipped a couple of times and damaged the brick a little. Luckily enough, it's not noticeable on the final product, but it could have been a lot worse. After scoring a few times, it was easy to snap the styrene parts apart. I then used a chisel blade to cut through the pilaster sections. Or at least I tried. The blade was a little too dull, so I replaced it. I put my used blades in an old prescription bottle that I keep around just for that purpose. That way there's no risk of anyone cutting themselves with a rogue blade in the trash if they happen to go fishing around. I then switched over to a more heavy duty chisel blade to finish the job. I repeated the process on the other wall. I used the straight edge to make sure I didn't damage the walls this time. This one wasn't quite ready to snap, so I scored it a few more times and then it went. With the pieces cut, I used my emery board again to remove any rough edges, and in this case there were some pretty rough edges. I then used my Dremel Moto Saw, which is a scroll saw, to cut the end wall to get a smooth, straight cut. There are Amazon affiliate links to this saw and a few other items in the description below. I double checked that the cut was square using a modified square that I made out of two carpenter's squares. With the cuts made, it was time to make sure that everything lined up correctly, and for this I again used a straight edge. To get the corner pilasters that came with the kit, which have a 45 degree edge for true corner joints, to attach correctly, I needed to sand my newly cut edges on my walls to a bevel of roughly 45 degrees. I then needed to cut two more wall pieces, one for the side where the cars would go through and another narrow piece to align with the tower on the left side. For this, I used Walther's brick sheets like I'd done for my Cambridge iron and metal building. The brick sheets as delivered ended up being just slightly taller than the structure's wall sections, but I got lucky because what I needed to remove was exactly the size of the molded tab that they give you to align overlapping wall pieces. I also cut that off with the Dremel saw. Next, I prepared the corner pilasters using my 1, 2, 3 blocks from Micromark to make sure they were square before cutting them to size and sanding off any rough edges. I tested my 45 degree edges to make sure I didn't need to remove any more material. I then used my same stuff solvent cement from Micromark to attach the corner pieces. I made final adjustments before the solvent evaporated to make sure there was a good corner joint. I repeated the process on the other side as well. While the corners set up, I measured the opening I was going to need in the sidewall to ensure cars would go through smoothly and mark the area I was going to need to remove. This opening, which is needed to provide access to the two staging tracks that are hidden behind the building, is not prototypical, and I'll need to find a good way to try and hide it when I get to the scenery stage. I once again used the score and snap method, remembering the straight edge this time, to cut out that opening. I put the piece I removed aside to put in the scrap box. You may say, well, why bother? But we'll see why in a little while. With the corners dry, it was time to glue the three main wall pieces together and add bracing. 
I didn't want to remove the window frames from the sprues before I painted them, but I did need to measure some things, so I measured where the window edges would fall while they were still on the sprue and marked the location on the backs of the walls. This would allow me to put bracing on the walls using 125 thousandths by 250 thousandths styrene strip to make sure the wall sections didn't split apart when the structure was being handled. I also attached a piece of that same size styrene to the bottom edge, and that would allow me to attach this assembly to the lower level assembly later. I used a straight edge to ensure everything was square in both directions. With the lower brace set, it was time to cut the braces for the wall splices using the same 0.125 by 0.250 styrene strip. I placed it over the joints and made sure it would clear the spots where the window frames would glue in and attach the styrene to the walls with solvent cement. I also butted the bottom of each piece up to the bottom brace for additional stability. This made for a sturdy and strong wall. Now it was time to attach the side walls to the pilasters. Luckily, the piece from the Walther's kit had a recess that was a perfect match for the thickness of the wall sheet, so it made for a good fit. Using my 123 blocks to ensure square corners, I used some of my off-brand Lego blocks that I got from the dollar store, in this case the 1x2 variety, to provide straight square bracing at the top and bottom of the walls. I made sure that they also wouldn't interfere with the window frames. I specifically placed them so that the bottom block was at the exact bottom of the wall, and the upper piece was spaced 2 inches above that using a 123 block to provide consistent spacing. I then glued the wall to the pilaster fully. To give the edge that would be up against the basement wall some additional support, I glued a 2x4 Lego block to that side. This would provide bracing as well as a solid footing for the back side of the structure. I then glued another 1x2 Lego block 2 inches above that, once again spacing it with my 1 2 3 block. This was not a random measurement. That placement would allow me to also string a piece of styrene across the wall above the opening for bracing, while also attaching it to the Lego blocks for additional structural integrity. So with the top portion of the building done, I needed something for the bottom, and given the pictures that were online, it was a mishmash of things down there. So I decided to use a mishmash of elements for my construction as well. So really this whole bottom section is going to be made up of scraps, a couple of doors that I had on hand, and some more styrene that was on hand. In essence, I'm hoping to make this whole bottom section basically out of nothing. I considered using DPM pieces similar to those in the curtain wall from part one for this section, and I even measured them out but found that they weren't the right size. That's when I decided to go with the Walther's brick sheet. You can tell by looking at the pieces that this was painted at one time for a different project, and then I stripped it waiting for the appropriate project. Apparently this was it. The width of the building here is 16 and a quarter inches. The first thing I did was take some 188 thousandths by 188 thousandths styrene to use along the top, which represents the concrete span at the top of the prototype section here. It'll give me a sturdy frame and allow me to use that as a location to attach this assembly to the top half when we get to that step. After measuring the width and height of the pilasters, I plan to use 60 thousandths by 156 thousandths styrene to represent the concrete posts that support the brick pilasters. This middle section is going to be open, or maybe I'll close it up and have a large door in there. Maybe one of these doors. You can see from the picture that it's mostly open on the prototype, but I don't know when they made that change to the building, or even if it was a change to the building. The other thing that I did was to take a Walther's wall section and cut it down to size. I originally thought I wouldn't have enough brick material, but I also thought it would be okay since this area over here will be behind the hill when I get the scenery in. Looking at the prototype, I also thought I could put personnel doors on these sections and that I could find something to represent these metal pieces. So that's when I went to my scrap box. Now these are just various plastic pieces that I have left over from other projects that I thought might be useful someday for a project just like this. I was able to find a couple of things. I found these two pieces from a Pike Stuff kit that I thought would be a decent representation of the corrugated metal pieces on this building. I also found this piece here which I thought was a good size to use as the concrete above the door on the left side. I'll also probably do some sort of decal there to include that date thing because I just think it's cool. To complete the decorative concrete around the door, I decided to use some half round styrene strip here on each side of the door. While I wanted to include that concrete look, I didn't want to go all out like they did on the prototype. In the end, it'll look something like this. The right side will be similar, although as you can see, it's not quite so decorative over there, so there probably will just be a plain door. As it turned out, I had enough brick sheet to do exactly what I wanted. The fact that I didn't have to use the full height because of the pike stuff pieces that I found meant that I had enough brick sheet left over to give me what I 
needed. So that's the plan to put these things together, with one exception. At this point, I still hadn't figured out what I was going to do in the middle. I could leave it open, but that would mean figuring out what to put behind it to keep the illusion of depth. I still wasn't decided, so I left it, hoping that I had it figured out by the time I started building. I also needed to figure out how to brace everything, but I left that as a game time decision for when I started piecing and gluing everything together. I started working on the bottom by cutting and sanding the pieces that would frame the center area. The concrete under the brick pilasters on the structure would sit on top of the concrete crossbeam to give it a look similar to the concrete on the prototype. Also on the prototype there are concrete posts just behind, so I copied this look as well. This would also give me a frame to attach all the pieces to as support. Which brings up a point. Overnight I'd made the decision to have the middle section closed so that I wouldn't have to worry about hiding or otherwise masking the foam that's going to be behind the wall. So more on that in a minute. You can see that I'm also using the top wall assembly as a guide to space everything and make sure that my styrene pieces are directly below the brick pilasters. When gluing, I also used a piece of the same size styrene to make sure that the styrene piece I was attaching to the front stayed flat. Here I'm using wax paper to prevent the solvent from melting the plastic and sticking the pieces to my mat. I double checked the measurements before moving on and used my 1-2-3 block to make sure the piece I was adding was straight and flush before gluing. Once the glue was applied, I used a machinist square, also from Micromark, to check the final angle before letting it set. I repeated the process for the other side, and again for the outer supports. I tested the fit of all the panels and numbered each one on the back to make sure they stayed in the right order. The panels weren't all yet cut down to size, so I also measured and marked those along with numbering them. Flipping the brick sheet over, I marked where I needed to make the bottom cut. I decided to use metal siding sheet styrene and a pike stuff loading door for the middle wall section, so I measured the styrene and marked where the cutout for the door would need to be. I cut the piece to size and then cut out the opening, again using the snap and score method, and then filing the opening down so it was smooth. With a final test fit, I was pretty happy with how this patchwork section was coming together. Now it was time to paint. For the top section, I chose the same red oxide brick color that I'd used for the curtain wall section of the building. I also used this color for the brick sheet sections on the bottom assembly. Once dry and in between other assembly operations, I used an aged concrete paint marker to paint the sills and lintels on the top assembly. I used a micro brush dipped in the same paint to touch up the sills where the coverage wasn't as good as I might have wanted. Later, I also went back and touched up some areas where I had gotten the concrete paint on the brick surface by using a micro brush and some paint from a bottle that was a close match for the sprayed on brick color. I was going to be using a mortar wash on the brick anyway, so you're unlikely to notice any minor color differences. I then painted all the pieces that I'd be using for the bottom assembly. I used Rust-Oleum Camouflage Khaki for the pieces meant to represent concrete, and after it dried, I used a light overspray of Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch Ultra Matte Perfect Gray to lighten the color a little bit and so that the parts would match the other concrete pieces in this structure. The pieces that were supposed to be metal were painted white, the loading door was painted primer gray, and the personnel doors got a different red primer color than the brick. I applied the same mortar wash I used in part one to represent mortar lines and toned down the dark red brick color on all the brick sections. Moving to the bottom assembly, I used my 1-64 to raw sienna and 1-64 to burnt umber washes to give the white metal pieces some age and the appearance of some rusty bits. The washes are made by diluting half a tablespoon of India ink of the appropriate color in a pint of 70% isopropyl alcohol. As you can see here, you only need a light touch with the brush to get the rust color to flow, and the two colors provide some contrast between newer rust and older rust. I didn't put these on in any real pattern except to have the darker color near the edges of the panels. I also applied the wash with the pieces upside down so that the heavier color would collect at what would appear to be the top of the wall section. It was finally time to piece everything together and glue it all in place. Since the fronts of the pieces were now painted, I used some dabs of CA to glue the metal pike stuff pieces in place, and then used the solvent cement to further meld the uncoated surfaces to the unpainted portion of the frame on each side. Using a straight edge to make sure that the top styrene bar didn't flex, I laid the brick panels in place, then used the same combination of CA and solvent cement to attach those on each side. Thank you. 
I used some additional styrene pieces for bracing for the center metal siding piece, attaching that with solvent cement as well. I then braced the heck out of the back so that there would be little chance of the whole thing bending, breaking, or just generally coming apart. With that set, I used CA to attach the personnel doors to the brick sheet, gluing them directly to the brick surface. I didn't bother to cut any of the brick sheet out to set the door frames into. Because of their location on the layout, it's going to make it really hard to tell from any normal viewing angle anyway. I then glued the decorative concrete pieces onto the surface, which proved to be somewhat difficult just due to the thin cross section of the quarter round, but I eventually got it all in place. As with part one, I used the black wash to tone down the mortar wash on the top portion. And the bottom portion. I then cemented the window frames into the walls using solvent cement. Then I glued the window glass on with CA, using a cup to provide a gap underneath for ventilation so that the CA didn't craze the window material. Like before, I painted one side of the windows black using Rust-Oleum Chalk Effects black color. To glue the two sections together, I stood the top portion upside down and used the two broad pieces of styrene I'd used to attach them together. To provide additional support at the joint, I used solvent cement to place more building blocks on the back. Here I used 1x4 and 2x4 tiles. Once it all set, I had a very solid structure that'll hold up to handling, stands on its own, and fits its location. Now it was time to finalize the area around the building. I had cut a gap in the foam and ceiling tiles during construction to test fit things as I went. But now that I had a complete structure, I made final adjustments using a utility knife, a modified putty knife, and a chisel blade X-Acto. This allowed me to get a solid base at both elevations for the building to sit on. This area will get more modifications in the scenery stage, but for now, this was all I needed. Finally, with all this taken care of, I placed the new piece in its final location, and part two was complete. This was a major project that required some thinking outside the box, no pun intended, as well as some creative planning. But I wouldn't say any of it was particularly hard to build from a modeling standpoint. This is a project that I think a modeler with limited experience could definitely build. I think the harder part is figuring out how it all should go together, and that just requires some patience and planning. Ever build anything like this? How'd it work out for you? Got any tips for me? I'd love to hear all about it in the comments below. That's also the place for questions and suggestions. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Links are in the description below. Don't forget, I offer mastermind groups that can help you to set goals and stay on track with your modeling. I also offer lots of other services like layout consultations, track planning, custom backdrop photo creation, and a lot more. To get more information, drop me a line at jparker at thepixeldepot.com. Now looking ahead to part three, we'll plan and install that tower section we saw, so keep an eye out for that. There are lots of different ways to kit bash, and you can learn more tips by clicking on the top left to watch my video on kit bashing the American can building for my grunge layout. To see how I scratch built the Cambridge Iron and Metal building, including a clever way to hide a sharp 90 degree turn in the track, click below that. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.